Hey everyone, welcome back. I am the Electrical Code Coach. This is 10 exam prep questions with full audio explanations. You can head over to electricalexamcoach.com to learn all about these concepts step by step. Before we get started, if you'll hit that subscribe button, it'll help us share and impact more people. Now let's talk about the best way to use this resource. So I'm going to read the questions one at a time. Right after I'm done reading them, pause the video and try to answer it yourself. And then unpause the video and you can watch a full detailed explanation. Let's get to it. What is the minimum burial depth for conductors in intermediate metal conduit that run underneath a building? The correct answer is zero. So we're going to head to table 300.5. We're going to start on the left hand side of the table and we're going to look for our specific location. If there's not one listed, we're going to use the all locations at the top of the table. Then we're going to come across and tee off with our respective column. And in this case, it's column two for IMC. And we're going to find that the correct answer is zero. Let's get to it. What size copper wire would you select for a 62 amp load that's expected to run for 10 or more hours, terminating to 75 degree C terminals? The correct answer is number four. When calculating your total amperage, you must do a 125% demand factor for all loads that are expected to run for three or more hours. You take your starting amperage multiplied by 1.25 and that's gonna equal your total known load. Then you're gonna to head to your primary opacity table and find a wire that will cover the total known load. We take our 62 amps, multiply it by 1.25, that gives us 77.5 amps. Now we head to our primary opacity table, being sure to be mindful to be on the copper side of the table because it's asking for the copper wire. Then we're going to start right here in the 75 degree C column. We come down and find a wire that will cover our 77.5 amps. Then we come over and tee off and find our size conductor. Let's get to it. What is the voltage across the open switch when the voltage supplying the switch is 120 volts? The correct answer is 120 volts. And I'm going to explain the open and closed switch questions right now. So let's imagine that we have this switch and let's imagine that it's on. Closed equals on. Well, we have a 120 volts on the top terminal. And with it being on, we would also have 120 volts on the bottom terminal, which would make there be a zero of difference in potential. It's all about the difference in potential. We have 120 on the top, 120 on the bottom. So there is no difference in potential. Now let's take a look and let's turn this switch off. Now we have an open off, and that's how I remember it. They both start with O, open, off. Now I have an off switch. So for ease of explanation, we're gonna imagine that we have zero volts on the bottom terminal and 120 volts on the top terminal. Now you could wire this either way, but we're gonna imagine that the top has the hot and the bottom is the switch leg. So with this switch in the open position, we have a difference in potential, don't we? We have 120 volts standing on the top screw, but currently with the switch off, we have zero volts on the bottom screw. Therefore, our difference in potential is 120 volts. All receptacles within blank feet of a pool or spa must be GFCI protected. The correct answer is 20 feet. We're gonna use our keyword and index process to find this answer. What are we talking about here? What are you wiring if you were setting in front of it? We're talking about receptacles, aren't we? So we head to R in the index. When we get to R, we're going to see if there are some other keywords under its subheading. We're gonna look for maybe pool, spa, maybe even GFCI protection. When we look for pools, we don't find it, but we do find swimming pools, and it has several code articles listed. The first one it sends us to is 680.21C, depending on what code cycle you're in. When we get there, we read the black bold heading and sure enough, it's, it's talking about GFCI protection. But when we quickly scan through the paragraph, it's not what we're looking for. But I feel like we're in the right section of the code book. So now we're gonna start looking at the black bold headings to see if we can pull out some of our other keywords. And we look, black bold heading, no, no, circulation systems, other receptacles, there's a keyword. And then the next one, sure enough, in a black bold heading is GFCI protection. Now we take the time to invest and read the paragraph. When we look down through there, we find, sure enough, 20 feet is the required 
distance that it's required to be. All receptacles within 20 feet of the pool or spa must be GFCI protected. I do want to note that this does not negate all of the requirements that are in 210.8 A and B. Those are going to be your overall requirements for GFCI protection. So this is in addition to that. Not only if 210.8A or B doesn't catch you for GFCI protection, you're also required to do it within 20 foot of the pool or spa. Let's get to it. What does the N in THHN stand for? The correct answer is nylon coated. So this is a picture that you can get at electricalcodecoach.com under free resources. And this is something that you can use to help you remember. This breaks them all down. How to find it in the code book is something that I actually want you to make a tab for. If you're allowed to make tabs in your state, if not, I just want you to go get familiar with the table. So you're going to head to table 310.4a and you're going to find THHN and then you would be able to find that it, it is equivalent to nylon coating. And when you get in there, you're going to learn all kinds of fun things about all the different types of wire, whether it's rated 75, 90, respectively, so on and so forth. I am the electrical code coach. Let's go ahead and get to it. X-ray equipment that will run for five minutes or longer. And it gives some options here. Now, the correct answer is long time rating. I want to train you to start looking at things like this as a definition because we might go a different route. But if you didn't call this a definition, and if you did and you caught the, and you read the play that it was a definition, first you would head to Article 100 and see if it was there, and then you would head to the dot two section of the specific article that you wanted to be in. But let's imagine that you didn't, um, you know, read the play that it was a definition. So we're going to use our keyword index process. What are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about X-ray equipment. So sure enough, we find X-ray in the index. But when we get there, there are no other keywords under it. So you could pick another keyword like equipment or so on, and you could go check in that part of the index. And that's exactly what I did. I went to equipment, didn't find anything about x-ray equipment. So it's like, now what do you do? And let me show you what I would do. The first thing I would do is when I was in x-ray in the index, it let me know that x-ray, the article was in 660. So I would head up to the table of contents. And I would go to 660, it's right in order, go to chapter 6, go to 660, and I would look and see if there were any other clues underneath of 660 that were keywords in my question. There's not. So really the only thing left to do at this point is to head to 660 and read every single black bold heading starting at the beginning of the article all the way through. Thankfully those specialty articles are very small. When you start this one, you start at the beginning of 660. And I do want to note the other thing that going to the table of contents did for us is told us a page number. That's the beauty of the ta table of contents is it tells you the page number that you're going to be on. So we knew to head to page 555. When we got there, we looked at the first few black bold headings. Sure enough, long time rating popped out one of our four choices, and it was the definition we were looking for. X-ray equipment that will run for five minutes or longer. Now, there are many angles that you can tackle a question, and I want to teach you as many as possible. And I don't want to teach you just the answer. I want to teach you a way of thinking and a structure that will not only give you the answer when you're, you know, you're testing, but will give you the answer when you're out in the field. For a single phase 240 volt residential service, what is the minimum size of grounding electrode conductor for a service with three yacht copper ungrounded conductors? The correct answer is 4 AWG. The first thing we ask ourselves when sizing grounding electrode conductors is does it mention the type of electrode? In this case, it does not mention the type of electrode, so we're going to use table 250.66 at face value. When we get to the table, we slow down and we make sure that we select from the copper side if they're copper ungrounded hots. And then if it's asking for a copper grounding electroconductor, we make sure that when we cross over, we select from the copper side as well. Burial depth for network powered broadband conductors shall be at least blank inches when installed below two inches of concrete when installed in RMC. 
So we're not going to head to table 300.5 for this one. We're actually going to head to a different table, but we're going to use our keyword and index process to do so. We're going to find that the correct answer is 6 inches, but now let's learn how we did that. So if we look at that, this question, what are we talking about here? We're talking about network-powered broadband conductors, aren't we? Now, that's a long set of keywords. Let's see if that is in the index, and if not, maybe you know narrow it down a little bit. So we find, and sure enough, there's a network-powered broadband conductor. So it's actually its own section in the index. When we get in there, we'll look back at our question, and we're going to start looking for keywords. And the only keyword I really see here is burial depth. So let's go down through and see if we see anything about burial depth. We don't. So now we have to start looking at the question, maybe looking for keywords. Should we head over to B in burial depth? Before I do that, I'm probably going to look the, west, the rest of the way through this little section under network powered broadband conductors. And the reason is, is that's very specific. I'm talking about network powered broadband conductors. I'm in the index and it has its own section. So I'm really going to dig in there to see if I can figure something else out. And this is where I want to teach you another way to think about these questions. You may not find an exact keyword, but what is the overall theme of this question? Yes, we're dealing with those conductors, but where are we at? Are we running through the air? Are we underground? Are we in concrete? And in this case, we're actually underground or in concrete. So we can use both of those to kind of guide our way and see if maybe those are some other keywords or some key themes that we get hit. Well, as we look down through here, we do see in the index talking about underground conductors. So we don't have a specific keyword, but we kind of have a theme of our question. And as we go to the underground conductors, it tells us to head to 830.47. When we get over to 830.47, we're going to use our black bold heading method to look around and see if we can find any more themes, any more keywords, or any of our four answers listed in these paragraphs. So as we get here, we look at the first black bold heading. It says underground broadband power communication cables entering a building. The next black bold heading talks about underground systems. So that could be very you know, familiar for our question. Part B talks about direct buried cables, and there is a number in the paragraph. I want you to always be watching out for numbers and paragraphs because you might be able to look back on the screen and it correlate with one of your numbers of your four answers. In this case, it doesn't, but at least we're in the same direction. It's talking about direct buried communication cables, and it's giving some inches. I feel like we're in the right area. We go down to the next one, which is part C, and it says protection for physical damage. Well, if we look at this question, that's what we're doing is protecting this wire from physical damage. We look down through here. It says direct buried cables shall be uh, met to meet the minimum cover requirements of 830. table 830.47C. If we look over on the next page, we see table 830.47C right there. It says network powered broadband communication systems, minimum cover requirements. And now I know I made it to the right area. So we used our main keyword. Then we used an overall theme of the question to get in the right section of the code book. When we got there, we started using black bold headings and really just looking around. And I'm always looking for a table right away. I just want you, I wanted to teach you the long way of how to do this, but I would have looked for this table right away. I get in the right area. I read a couple black bold headings. I feel like I'm doing good. I look around to see if there are any tables. When we get to this table, we start on the left-hand side and we find our specified location. Then we come across to our type conduit, which is rigid metal conduit. And then we find our burial depth requirement of six inches. What is the allowable ampacity of a number 10 THWN-2 copper conductor in an area with an ambient temperature of 114 degrees Fahrenheit in a conduit with four current carrying conductors? The correct answer is 26 amps. We start out this question by heading to our primary ampacity table. We're first going to make sure that our insulation type of THWN-2 is listed in the 90 degree column of the copper side because we're dealing with copper. It is. So now we're going to go down and choose our starting ampacity, which in this case is 40 amps. Then we're going to head over to our bundling adjustment factor table. We're going to start on the left hand side and find our number of conductors and come over and find our percentage in demand, demand factor and percentage. We're going to write that down. So on our piece of paper, we've wrote down 40 amps multiplied by 
0.80. And then we're going to head over to our temperature correction factor table. We're going to mind whether we're Celsius or Fahrenheit. We're going to start in the Fahrenheit column, come down and find our temperature, and then be sure to come back to the 90 degree C column for that correction factor. We have our 40 amps multiplied by 0 0.80 multiplied by 0.82. That gives us a new allowable ampacity of 26.24 amps. We would round down, in my opinion, and we would select 26. Let's get to it. 6-inch PVC must be supported at a minimum of every blank feet. The correct answer is 8 feet. We're going to use our PVC tab for this one. For almost every type of cable and pipe, there's a tab for it. And if you're not able to tab your code book, you could use the keyword and index process. But if you'll just start committing to memory that there are specific articles for almost every type of conduit and cable, then you'll know that you can use these tabs. So we're going to use our PVC tab. We're going to head to the dot 30 section. In all of these cables and pipes, whether it's rigid metal, liquid tight flexible metal, or anyone in between, the dot 30 section is going to be for securing and supporting. A lot of these articles have tables. So we're going to head to section 352.30 and we're going to head to table 352.30. We're going to start on the left hand side, use the table accordingly, and we're going to select 8 feet. I want you guys to familiarize yourself with all of the different types of conduit and cable articles and specific dots like dot 10 being uses permitted, dot 12 being uses not permitted, and dot 30 being securing and supporting. 